Welcome to Bergen Forest Monastery live stream. Uh, my name is Ajahn Sona, and we're here to answer some questions for you today. So, without further ado, Pia, please ask the first question. Ajahn, our first question is from the live feed from Benjamin in Franklin, Massachusetts. Dear Ajahn, I have been keeping the five precepts and want to live as the Arahants do and take up the eight precepts as written in the Yangutra Nikaya. Any guidance? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> the uh, Arahants, as you refer to them, that is the fourth stage of enlightenment. And the Arahants do not live by eight precepts. They, by the time one becomes an Arahant, one is inevitably enters the Sangha as a formal ordination as a monk. It is very clear that there are no lay people who remain, who are arahants and remain in the lay or household life. However, the third stage of enlightenment, which is called anagami, uh, non-returner, is possible that a lay person may have attained such a state and they do in fact live intrinsically on the eight precepts. Uh, they primarily because they have lost uh, desire and craving for the ordinary activities of life. <clears throat> so they become automatically celibate. They're no longer interested in sensual uh, relationships. Their use of food is primarily just to sustain the body. They live an absolute simple life. They are disengaged from uh, entertainment and socializing. So this is the eight precepts primarily. The eight precepts are what is temporarily taken for all lay people when they go to a, a monastery to spend time in a monastery. Usually in the time of the Buddha, it would mean that they would take the eight precepts for a day and a night if they went to the monastery. Lots of lay people uh, take the five precepts up and uh, in fact, rarely go to monasteries. They, they have they get benefits out of uh, the teachings of the Buddha and following the five precepts in ordinary life, which are quite manageable. <coughs> and the uh, eight precepts are suited for interacting with the monastic community. So you don't have the lay people having a, a barbecue at six in the evening while the monks are abstaining from a meal in the afternoon. So uh, there's conflict there. You don't playing music, singing and dancing, etc. while the monks are trying to meditate. <clears throat> so this is why the uh, eight precepts are set up. As one progresses along the path, though, one finds it more and more that their lifestyle is sort of coming into accord with these eight precepts and one tends to prefer to live that way without re rigidly following rules perhaps, but uh, just it just becomes a natural way of life. Simple, in other words. Simple and non-sensual. <clears throat> so there's nothing stopping you from living that life except perhaps if you're... <laughs> If you're enmeshed in a family, you may find it inconvenient that the family around you doesn't want to doesn't want you to live that way. They want you to eat supper with them, and they watch TV and go to the baseball game and all this kind of stuff. So, this is why it's it's awkward. <clears throat> Some people are married, and they suddenly they go and start meditating, and they they suddenly want to take eight precepts. One of them, which one of which is. Uh, celibacy. <laughs> now that may be inconvenient for their their partner. So I've had lots of people ask me, uh, you know, how do I manage to do this? I'm married. I've been in this in that situation, and I say, well, you know, this is why people become monastics, or why you go on retreat, because you can take these things up very diligently. You can take up the eight precepts in a certain context, and that is in a retreat center or a monastery for a period of time while remaining a layperson. So, <clears throat> you know, you have to decide if you're going to make a lot of uh, inconveniences or whether you're going to just uh, 
start to change your lifestyle and your relationships to others because you just don't want to do what most people want to do. You don't want to go dancing and drinking and uh, out to the baseball game and the all kinds of distractions and empty kind of pursuits which ordinary people thrive on. Uh, these fall away for the person on the serious, seriously on the spiritual path. You just become uninterested in, in such things. So this is the dilemma for the lay person. And uh, that is why, in fact, the Buddha set up the Sangha as a, as a place to go. And for one who's really serious about it, that's where they will find that their lifestyle is supported in that way. So that's just a brief uh, bit of discussion around these eight precepts and the and its function in the layperson's life. Let's go on to the next question, Pia. Our next question is from Keller in Naperville, Illinois, United States. I am currently working to pay off student loans to eventually be eligible to become a bhikkhu. Involuntarily remaining a householder is a deep source of dukkha for me and is compounded by an intense hatred for existence itself. I feel incapable to address this mass of suffering because it is intricately interwoven with my samvega and motivation for living the holy life. Viva, vibhava tanha is the primary fuel of my spiritual efforts. Any advice? Yes. So first I want to define for the audience, he, he wants to become a bhikkhu, which is uh, what I am. I'm, I'm a bhikkhu, a monk. So this, this word monk is just borrowed from the... Uh, the English, uh, the Catholic tradition, but we're not really monks, we're bhikkhus, so that's the uh, proper word for one who wants to become a monastic in the Theravada uh, tradition. So I would say, first of all, that you, you need to get past the hatred of, the, of life. <laughs> Vibhava uh, tanha means the thirst for non-existence. And that has to be overcome as well as bhava tanha, the thirst for existence. So one is neither hoping for extinction nor wishing for eternity. These are the extremes and the middle path goes right through the middle of those. You, and this is what happens, and quite often uh, in the spiritual path, you become somewhat disgusted with uh, ordinary life, and it's a, typically a stage that one goes through. One is critical of everything. People are people appear foolish and wasting their time and so silly, and, and everything is meaningless and on and on. So as one meditates, though, uh, one evolves and eventually this kind of hostility falls away and you realize that you are to practice what is called a sense restraint. In your experience of the ordinary life in the world, when you go to a shopping mall, when you're, it's a rainy day and you're on the parking lot at Walmart getting some sort of thing for your living room, you, it's very easy to fall into a sense of dismay, etc. But this is what the Buddha is referring to as sense restraint. Restraint of the critical faculty. So you're investing unwisely in, uh, unwise attention to the fault of the world. And how do you know it's unwise? It's because this aversive emotion comes up. So you can know about the faults of the world. You, you know if the traffic in your city could be better. You know if your car is, is a lemon. You know that and you take it to the garage. But uh, you don't do it with hostility or ill will. So this is something to practice uh, until, you, uh, until you become a bhikkhu and then even after you become a bhikkhu, even more so you need to practice this non-aversion to the world. So you're giving up 
attraction to the world, but you're also giving up aversion to the world. So in the midst of this, before you get to the robes, you really need to work on this sense of starting to feel okay, starting to feel okay, that you're able to function in the, the normal life without uh, attachment. And attachment is not just simply grabbing and clinging to something, it's also pushing things away. So attachment means that you're you have an aversion to things and, a, and another way of talking about attachment is desire for things. So both of those have to go. So you feel free in the midst of this. And that freedom is, is starting to resemble this aspiration to Nibbana, to the cessation of uh, this, all of the drives that keeps, uh, keep us in uh, the endless rounds of samsara. So I would advise you right now to start to think like a bhikkhu. The bhikkhus have to go on alms round every day, every morning into the village. And the Buddha says, well, you just had this lovely meditation in the morning and, and you like your quiet, natural monastery and now you have to go looking for food in the, in the local village and there you will encounter all kinds of the craziness of ordinary life and sights and sounds that you don't like, people that you don't like. And uh, he says, what should you do? You should practice sense restraint. You should not have a sense of aversion to people and things. You should hold on to the sign of peace. So first of all, you've got to establish the sign of peace within you and then keep your eye on that sign of peace uh, and don't let it go. Don't fall into this very easy uh, thing of, of, criti of being critical about everything. Being critical about everything is very easy, but it's a trap and it's a trap you create for yourself. So you free yourself from this aversion. And then you will, when you finally do get into the robes, then you will be halfway along the path. Okay. Our next question is from the live feed from Ariel in Rockford, Illinois, United States. Ajahn, when dealing with decisions of the future and applying right view and right effort, should one take a riskier path to see a better future or the safe path then end up, end, then end up regretting not risking it? Yes, this kind of question comes up quite often and people ask, what should I do? You know, they have a choice. Should I leave my, my husband? Should I change my job? Should I move to another country? Should I drop out of school? Should I, and, and what, will ha what will be the best choice where it, where it all works out happily ever after? Well, I, I, nobody can tell you if it's going to work out. So that's one thing to set aside. You can make sort of calculated risks. You think, well, it's it, there's something reasonable in the possibility that it'll this decision, although there are risks to it, it will work out and then it'll be profitable to me, it'll be good for me. But nobody can tell you for sure if it will. All you can do is calculate your intention now. Is the decision being made with courage or with loving kindness or with the, the spirit of generosity. If it's made with uh, your best mind, your courageous mind, then you will have trouble regretting it. If things don't work out, can you regret having been courageous? Even And if things do work out, uh, then you will be very happy uh, about how it worked out. But And if things don't work out, you will at least have been courageous. But on the other hand... If you stick with the safe but not satisfactory situation, then the fact that you made that decision from fear, you will never be at ease with that. You will always think, uh, yeah, I, I'm safe, but I, I was a bit of a coward. So this is, the, this is all you can evaluate. You can't know whether it's going to work out, but you can know whether you're your decisions and your actions are based on courage or on uh, on fear. 
and fear you won't look back on approvingly and courage you will look back on approvingly. Okay, next question. Our next question is from Anonymous in Minneapolis, Minnesota, United States. To shift from anagami to arahant, what needs to be refined in one's practice? Are the instructions the same? Any identity can form even in the way one is discerning. Is it, in the end, a matter of synchronicity and inquiry as well as right effort and samadhi? Well, the word synchronicity is certainly not a Buddhist word. It's a a Jungian (laughs) term. (laughs) Uh, Once one attains to the third stage of enlightenment, uh, the fourth stage is inevitable. Uh, this, the term, the Pali term for the third stage of enlightenment is anagami or non-returner. There is no return. There is no rebirth in the human dimension or lower. Uh, and there is, it's not a, not a, a sensual heaven or anything. This is only a specific uh, possibility of continuation. And that's in this special dimension which is reserved only for anagamis, the third stage of enlightenment. And from there, one can spend a a substantial amount of undistressed time until one inevitably attains enlightenment. So it's not exactly a crisis. Um, You're in a... An anagami is in a very good situation. And I I want to remind everybody that anagami... If you're reading books about Buddhism and you think you're an anagami, um, you might want to get some uh, feedback from experienced teachers because that's an exalted uh, spiritual state and uh, it's very easy to be misinformed entirely about one's own attainments. And it's that would be... Uh, uh, <laughs> of concern because do not in overestimate yourself it's a bad thing to do if you do anything underestimate yourself so going on from anagami to arahant is a reflection it's it's the wisdom faculty because the all that is tying you know all the fetters that remain there are five fetters which remain are very very subtle and uh this idea of identity making and so forth is when you read the five fetters, uh, conceit is is one of the translations. Uh, however, a conceited anagami is the idea of a conceited an- anagami is not not a good translation. It's the slight uh, trace every now and then of a of a of a sense of self, a leftover sense of self. The basic insight into the what is called sakaya ditti the the view of self a fixed uh, view of a sort of a, an unchanging essential soul which ha- is a, identical through time <clears throat> and possibly eternal is seen through in the first stage of enlightenment so why why is there some sort of sense of i is just a trace uh, it's just the, it's just a slight after smell of something. It's it's not not substantial. So the, these are just traces of remaining things. There is some attachment to uh, deep samadhi experiences as well. And by the way, that's there's no reason. It's not a it's not not a problem with samadhi. The Buddha praised samadhi, but because these deep states can be very pleasurable, very subtle and, and very pleasurable. Uh, they can be cloud one's perfect clarity and wisdom. So that's the only thing that you're getting rid of is this ability to enter and abide in these exquisite kind of states of consciousness and the tendency to, to cling to it slightly. <clears throat> And that is going to dissolve. And by the way, it doesn't mean that you no longer enter these states, sublime states of consciousness. The arahants enter samadhi and abide and dwell in deep jhana. 
And so <clears throat> it's not an impediment. It's your relationship to these states that are the impediment. So, yes, it's a very subtle state, and, and please uh, be very careful about self-assessment about this. It's like guessing your own IQ, thinking you're a genius. <laughs> it would be better to go and get rigorously tested. <laughs> okay, Pia, that's the next question. The question is from the live feed from Steve in Victoria, B.C., Canada. I struggle with the concept of rebirth in Buddhist cosmology. Is there a way to better conceptualize them for a Western audience? Or is understanding slash belief necessary before embracing Buddhism? Uh, belief is not necessary. Uh, even direct uh, knowledge is not necessary. Uh, there are all kinds of reports in the suttas of people who did not have any recollection of past lives. Who, attain, who had attained enlightenment, who were... So you person with full enlightenment does not remember their past life, or etc. However, it should be... It, what's an impediment is a conviction of the opposite, that there is no resultant from this life. So the basic, what we would call mundane right view, the, the beginning, a beginning is not to hold strongly to a, an annihilationist view that if you have a strong conviction that at death you are you are mere materiality which uh, ceases so that that uh, strong conviction is an impediment to your practice so what you're going to do is um, you you have to be honest with yourself say i don't i the society i have been born into the kind of talk that i've been around that i've never Nobody ever talks about their past life, and I, I don't, why, how could that be if nobody talks about it in my society? Well, first of all, you have to question your cultural assumptions. Uh, and secondly, uh, science is not uh, designed to uh, confirm or deny prior life uh, ex existence. Uh, physics doesn't do that. Uh, psychology, though, uh, there are many, many um, reports by uh, psych psychological investigation of people who apparently have past life memories, which can be confirmed. Uh, there's a very large collection by uh, the University of Virginia, and they have a special department which has collected cases of uh, on especially children who recall past life. And the type of cases that they collect and study are primarily children because the prior life is not too long before. And then you can investigate what the child says about where they lived, what their name was, how they died, etc. And uh, so they send out people to see if they can confirm any of these memories, which... Uh, some children spontaneously and strongly are convinced of. So they, they have a bank of about 2,500 uh, case studies from cultures around the world. Some of the cultures are non-Buddhist. They, they, don't, they, they don't have a belief in, in prior life, and so it's quite disturbing to the, <laughs> to the parents of these children and to the children themselves sometimes. Uh, so... There is a, a lot of, as a considerable body of evidence that would uh, give you pause for thought in terms of the possibility of prior life. You know, when uh, there's all kinds of programs out there and you, YouTube videos and stuff on on uh, people uh, dying and seeing heaven and so forth about all kinds of questions about the, the afterlife. And in Buddhism, there's rarely any interest in the afterlife. You know why? Because this is the afterlife. <laughs> Welcome to the afterlife. Next time you go to a, a party with your friends, say, you know, I know all about the afterlife. I have direct knowledge 
of the afterlife. Now they'll be holding their wine glasses and looking at you. What? Are you crazy? Or have you had a revelation? You say, yeah, oh no, it's it's very much like this. You know, it's it's like we go to parties, the afterlife, we go to parties, we swim, we have sports teams, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So because the Buddha, <laughs> this is the after, from a Buddhist point of view, this is the afterlife. You know, you know all about it. There are animals everywhere. <laughs> are there animals in the afterlife? Yes. Pet dogs all the time. <laughs> yeah. Strange. I mean, this is like to redo the whole configuration of the Western mind. <clears throat> So anyway, you don't have to believe any of this. Uh, and it's up to you to use it skillfully. But what I would say, and what perhaps the teaching of the Buddha, which you might want to read this sutta called the uh, uh, Teachings to the Kalamas. It's called the Kalama Sutta, K-A-L-A-M-A. -A -A. It's in the uh, Anguttara Nikaya 3s. Uh, the numbered sayings, threes. Anyway, that is a, a teaching to the Kalamas. There are a group of people that the Buddha talks to, who, who invite the Buddha to talk to, and they, they don't believe anything particularly. They've had a lot of p teachers passing through claiming this and claiming that, and they don't know what to believe. So they're at, they ask the Buddha, okay, so we would like to invite you for a talk about how to choose what to believe, how to choose a religion, how to choose a philosophy. So that discourse is on the elements of choosing a, how to, what to commit to, what, what philosophy to, to take, and, and the consequences of this. When you don't have any personal knowledge of these things, how do you make these choices? So this is a very, there's a specific discourse by the Buddha on this. And it's very much different than most religious approaches. Nobody's trying to you know, make you, uh, get you baptized or take Jesus as your personal savior or any of this kind of stuff. There's Buddhism is not a proselytizing type of religion. We don't, we know it doesn't work. So if you're interested, you explore it and you can have some personal confirmation that certain things work here and now for you. Other things you may never confirm uh, but others apparently have knowledge of these things, etc. So it's uh, it's like that. This is the case, of course, for even modern science. Uh, unless you have a PhD in physics, most of what physicists talk about, the quantum dimensions and everything, is you simply have to take on faith. I mean, who, if you don't have that technical ability, how do you know that what they're talking about is is even close to the truth. You don't. But they're kind of peer reviewed. They're interacting with each other, criticizing each other and so forth. And so you think, I presume they know something, something that I'll never know directly, but I, I, I sort of trust that they're, they're on the right track, that kind of stuff. So that is the same in the spiritual dimension, the types of knowledge that one can have. Yeah. Okay. Our next question is also from the live chat from Ali in Iran. Dear Ajahn, there is a quote in the manual of the Abhidhamma by Bhikkhu Bodhi which states, quote, Great seers who are free from craving declare that Nibbana is an objective state which is deathless, absolutely endless, end quote. Is Parinibbana therefore objective and felt? Why didn't they articulate more like the Abhidhamma talks about the mind and mental analysis despite being very hard to put into words? Well, Ali, welcome to the fun house. <laughs> now you're into it. <laughs> Nibbana and Pari Nibbana. Oh, uh, it is frustrating trying to sort that stuff out. Oh my goodness. Uh, well, so especially the Abhidhamma. Now the Abhidhamma, you know, uh, Abhidhamma is what well, part of what we call the Tipitaka, the three baskets. 
and uh, it's the third basket, and it's a very analytical thing. It looks like the chemistry tables, you know, or table of the elements, or it looks like some professors got a hold of some body of knowledge and decided to reduce it to all its basic elements. It's very abstract. And it lo appears from history that it's it's a later edition. It's it's uh, worked out by monks and not necessarily delivered by the Buddha himself. There are uh, stories, perhaps apocryphal, and if you don't know what that word means, look it up. <laughs> apocryphal, uh, which suggests that uh, they they suggest that the Buddha did deliver these in a very esoteric, strange way. Uh, it. From a linear historical point of view, it appears to be not credible. And there are all kinds of interesting theories about that. I mean, particularly in the forest tradition, which uh, I trained in, uh, there is virtually no reference to Abhidhamma, no study of it whatsoever. Uh, in uh, the Burmese tradition, uh, there is a very uh, strong uh, interest in Abhidhamma. Some Sri Lankan uh, traditions have uh, interest in the Abhidhamma, others do not. So when you start uh, looking into the Abhidhamma, it, you are looking into something like quantum physics. Uh, it is, uh, or theories like, um, what is it, multiple universes? Uh, you know, that, what do they call that? Multiverse. Multiverses, yes. So beware when you enter the uh, abandoned hope, all who enter the Abhidhamma. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, this is a, so especially Nibbana and Pari Nibbana. So you distinguish those two. Be, so Nibbana is, is, can be a, is, a, is a personal and direct experience. So the, the experience of Nibbana, which is another word for the, Cessation of all suffering is the awakening of wisdom, but that is not what a, what parinibbana is. Parinibbana is uh, what the reference to when an arahant, a fully enlightened person, dies. That is their parinibbana, and pari means final nibbana. By the way, it's quite interesting if you read. Um, Indian newspapers, bless you. <laughs> the Delhi Times or whatever. If they're talking about a funeral, they'll often refer to the person's their funeral as their pari nirvana, nirvana in Sanskrit, pari nirvana. Uh, more or less like, and they, of course, the quite often it's cremation. So they cremate the body, and refer to like an ordinary person dying as pari nirvana. Um, so you, this kind of terminology has to be carefully understood. So this is the, the death of the arahant. And, and so this is the famous question which is asked, uh, what happens to the arahant when they die? And uh, it is the, the, the answer the Buddha gives is like, well, what happens to a fire when it goes out? Does it go, which direction does it go? To the north, to the south, to the east, to the west? And when you're, when you ask where does the, when a fire goes out, you don't think, well, it goes any direction, it just goes out, doesn't it? It's extinguished. <clears throat> and so that is the what the Buddha gives as a, a example of the the wrongness of the question: What happens at Parinibbana? He just goes back and says that the the five khandas, the five elements which make up a human, the body and the uh, feelings, perceptions, uh, consciousness, and what are called vol volitions. All of these things are processes, and they they happen in a in a causal sequence, and they're not things. They're processes, and there is no other entity outside of those processes. It's not a special soul or something. 
which is not one of those processes. And so the person asking the question, what happens to the arahant, is probably asking what happens to the guy, to the person, uh, when they die. And uh, the Buddha has explained basically that there is no person, it's just a convention, there, there never was a person, but there are flowing patterns called the khandhas. So it's something like asking what happened to the unicorns? Daddy, what happened to the unicorns? And, and Daddy says, well, there are no unicorns. And you say, well, did they get killed? Were they all killed? <laughs> I said, no. Oh, so there's still some alive. No, there's none alive. And none of them are dead. There never were any unicorns. So this is the thing, you know, if there never was a self asking about what happens to it, Atparinibbana is a strange question. So, as I say, uh, enjoy the uh, Abhidhamma. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, let's go on. <laughs> Our next question is from Anonymous in Cork, Ireland. If one is fortunate to have four hours a day freed exclusively for the practice and is no spring chicken, could Ajahn please share some advice on how to use this time skillfully, e.g. chanting, meditating, reading the suttas, studying Pali, etc.? Well, I'm not sure who was being called no spring chicken. Was it me or you? <laughs> Who's no spring chicken? I think most of us, neither of us are us. A spring chicken. <laughs> so yes, if you got four hours a day, use it for all of those things. Uh, use it for uh, chanting, meditation, uh, practicing uplifting uh, emotions like loving kindness and compassion, equanimity. All of these things are all good. The exact proportion and how much time you should spend on each is not. It's not possible to say. Uh, they're all, they all have benefits, but you should examine it with your own wisdom and say, like, which, which one is profiting me? I, I don't want to just do this as a, as a grim exercise, which is supposed to be good for me. I have to think, who am I? What do I need? If I'm, am I sad? Am I angry? Uh, I, then I need more loving kindness. I, I, uh, am I greedy? I, I need to reflect more so that I'm not preoccupied with toys, you know? Uh... Am I scattered, aimless? Then I need to focus. I need to learn how to focus. Do I need inspiration? Well, I need to read some books that uplift me and inspire me or go to watch a, a live stream uh, by Ajahn Sona, who is no spring chicken. <laughs> so next. <clears throat> Ajahn, our next question is from... Find it here. Bhavani in India. Body will be destroyed repeatedly. Will the destruction of the other four khandas stop rebirth? If so, how to destroy the other khandas? Yes, that's a strong term. Destroy, destroy. Um, let's allow them to go to cessation instead of destroying them. <laughs> so... The body, yes. Oh well, the body is, of course, destroyed. I mean, it is. It's pretty graphic. We're in a we're in a desperate situation, my friends. We're all gonna die. <laughs> Nobody gets out alive. <clears throat> this body is not. There's not a hope that that you're gonna live <laughs> through this through this thing called life. <clears throat> you're going to. Yeah. So Bhavani is on to the right tr attitude. That it, it's it's a problem, and no matter what kind of world you might conceive yourself being born into or reborn into, uh, whether it even, even in the heavens. Uh, so the Buddha has a saying, it, even, it, even in heaven, it ends in tears. <laughs> <clears throat> there is no permanent escape. There is no sort of existence wherein death does not follow. Uh, so that's the aspiration is to nibbana, the cessation of the five khandas, these five elements which make up a human uh, cease 
and and are, and you arrive at this condition of ultimate peace, the cessation of greed and hatred and delusion, and the energies that keep that this delusion energy keeps you revolving in these is intrinsically unsatisfactory states. So how do you arrive at this? How do you free yourself from the other four khandas, which you talk about? Is through, <coughs> gener- <coughs> is through sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila being virtue, samadhi being uh, concentration, and panya being wisdom. And this involves basically the, it, the Eightfold Path, the, the right, it starts with right view, the right view of things. And you're on to the you're on to the beginning of this. There's a problem with existence. And then, so now what do you do? So this is the Eightfold Path, is what you do about this. Okay, that's very in brief. Our next question is also from the live chat from Norma in South Florida. Why do I have aversion to being a bodhisattva practitioner? I have hindrances to work on. Meditation is getting interesting. Do you think it is too much self-cherishing? Thank you. Well, you're a bodhisattva practitioner, meaning you're a Mahayana school practitioner. Well, maybe you're onto something, and uh, maybe you you don't want to be a bodhisattva. And who told you you had to be a bodhisattva? And it's not a. It's by the way, it's not found in the original teachings. The uh, the, the Buddha does not advocate. Uh, in general, people being bodhisattvas, following the path of towards Buddhahood, it, it's not uh, generally advocated at all. It's not part of the original school. The uh, urging is towards uh, enlightenment as soon as possible, the Arahant path. And so this bodhisattva path idea is a, ver- is a later, much later development, <clears throat> and, it, and it keeps developing many, many centuries later. And, uh, you know, to make, to walk into a temple and, and make a vow, all beings I vow to liberate, uh, I, I vow to remain in samsara until all beings are liberated, and this kind of stuff is quite an outrageous demand on, a, on an individual. And who, who wants to do this? This is the, the notion of the ultimate hero's journey. It is equivalent to swimming across the universe through blood, you know. Um, so maybe you want to rethink that you don't want to do that. <laughs> maybe you... Uh, that's why Buddhas are such rare beings, because it's not suitable for the vast, vast majority of beings. What's suitable for them is to find the exit as soon as possible. And you may find yourself heaving a sigh of relief and renouncing your idea, bodhisattva vows. If you've taken vows, you, it's perfectly okay to say, I, I changed my mind. I don't want that vow. <laughs> I took it when I didn't understand it. So because of that, then I'm changing my mind about things. I'm going on a different route and I'm heading for the exit uh, as soon as possible. So that's a, a consideration. Our next question is from the live chat from Upasaka Vasili in Switzerland. Dear Ajahn Sona, what's your advice for someone dealing with constant head pressure and headaches caused by practice? Yeah, well, you, um, you want to question whether it is caused by practice. Is it caused by practice or is it caused by there's all kinds of reasons for this, and this is this can, can come up. Uh, of course, people who don't practice have headaches and pressures as well, and sometimes it's because of uh, uh, psychological difficulties early in life that leave you uh, unresolved and and with tension. Sometimes it's it's more it's closer to the time you're in. Uh, so you're in a job where there's has too much pressure. You're in a relationship with too much pressure, uh, stress. So we're in a in a time when uh, the the entire world seems to accept uh, accept the idea that humans should be under stress all the time, and it's just part of life. 
you know, too many demands, too much work, too many dangerous options, uh, stress, stress, stress. This is, this, uh, life is not meant to be that way. So you, you might have to rethink everything, including if you're creating stress through your practice, that, that's something you don't need. That's, it's not to create more stress. And there are wrong ways to approach meditation. And there's all kinds of schools of meditation that are very grim and very harsh. So look, uh, it's as a short answer, I, I want to just direct you to go and listen to my videos on meditation. And start with the, the whatever it was, a 10 talks on loving kindness. Uh, and then some of the talks on mindfulness and right effort. So you, you, you might be making the wrong kind of effort uh, to inflict uh, these kind of headaches and problems on yourself. You really, you, you, this is a welcome to relax, or you know, more ease, joy, spaciousness, health, uh, health of the mind per, per, particularly. And, and when your mind is, is more healthy, then the experience of the body will be more merciful as well. So uh, please check those out. I made those uh, so that people can find their way through this without any unnecessary suffering. Yeah, please check those out. Next question is from the live chat from Chris. Ajahn, my son has PTSD from his experience in war in Afghanistan. Would you all pray for him at Birkin? His name is Matt. Yes, indeed, we would. Uh, I, I'm radiating loving kindness for him right at this very moment. Anybody with PTSD, you know, uh, but even more than <clears throat> meta being radiated for a person is that they, they need to find their way to, uh, specifically for PTSD, loving kindness. They need to bathe in loving kindness because the sense of loving kindness is takes away fear and PTSD. Like if you're in a war situation, your life, you're, you're in a life threatening situation all the time. And, and the, the fear reflex comes up so many times that you can't let it go. And then it starts to take on a life of its own and, and recur again and again. So one has to find oneself to this loving kindness because that feels like you're safe. And the only safety you're ever going to have in life is the feeling of safety. And the only trauma and danger in life is the feeling of fear. So for him, he has to devote, not just occasionally, but like immerse uh, for the rest of his life in, in a practice of profound friendliness, goodwill turned inward towards himself, toward, toward outward to others. And he will start to experience a... a a cessation, a freeing of the, the whole intrinsic fear of death <clears throat> and a clarification of mind and a, an improvement of his emotional well-being, etc. So this is very, very important and a good therapy for him. Yeah. Our next question is from the live chat from Samrit. Dear Ajahn, how to practice practice honesty with discretion as sometimes being truthful and providing more details than needed can turn, turn things against us in this world. Yes, indeed. Uh, and it's very hard to do the infinite calculations to find this the right algorithm to, to say the right thing at the precise time. However, your emotional structure can do that. Your, your heart, in it, when it's in a place of goodwill, when you're relaxed and in a, a place of goodwill, what comes out of your mouth is truly amazing. Uh, it Love is genius. Uh, it says the right thing at the right time in the right way. And you can't say the right thing at the right time in the right way through the intellect, through any other means, basically, 
than really a good, warm human heart. And that is the thing that's, that speaks the truth in the right way. So that's the secret. Don't, never mind the words, just mind the heart. Get the emotions in the right place and then you'll know when to speak and when not to speak. Yes. Our next question is from the live chat from Walter in Salt Lake City, Utah, United States. Ajahn Sona, I often cry during breath meditation. It is not tears of joy. Any advice to get, get past this? I also cry during loving kindness. Yeah, well, the, these are upwellings of uh, uh, repressed uh, emotion. Uh, and a lot of people have this. Uh, I, I've conducted, I don't, I've lost track of how many retreats I've given two-day, five-day, ten-day retreats, on and on and on. I, I, this monastery that we're in is a retreat monastery, so we, we just continuously are in retreat here, and lots of people cry. <laughs> <laughs> lots of people cry. And I actually, you know, I screen people before they take a ten-day retreat because I want to know that they have experience. To walk into something off the street um, is not a good idea. It can be... Meditation, facing yourself without distraction, can be quite overwhelming. And it's not good for everybody to do that all the time. Uh, you need to be careful. The mind is a delicate thing. So, yes, you're, you're having a fairly common experience. A lot of tears in, in meditation retreats. Uh, memories come up injustices come up, things, your own failings and the failings of others come up, your own fears come up bursting through and so forth. And uh, so that's, you know, that's why you, you have the company of a, of a competent teacher perhaps or a good solid spiritual friend and uh, you can uh, feel, ga gain some strength and uh, help from them as well. So yes, you, that's not unusual, not, not, and it's almost to be expected. Uh, eventually, if you, have the, if you work on right view about these things, about the nature of the, the truth, is very helpful. That the Buddha says right off the bat, you know, the, <laughs> the, this suffering is just intrinsic to existence. People say that say bad things to you, they, they lie to you, they deceive you, and then you lie and deceive, and then you regret it, and you, <clears throat> people threaten you, and you threaten them, and I just, um, it's, a, it's quite a mess. It's good to get that off your chest to get, say, oh yeah, right, I thought it was going to be different, I thought it was going to be nice, but no, it turns out it's, it, it can be very dangerous, and uh, very slippery and un uncertain. So it's nice to hear that, to get that out in the open. You know, the whole thing is precarious. It's dangerous. Well, it's nice to hear that. It's, it's, so that's the way it is. <clears throat> now, there's something you can do about it. So this is the next part. Is like, but there are ways of navigating this. So that's good too. So there's a, you know... Uh, I talk with people in retreats as well. I give interviews and I, you know, I've given well over 10,000 one-on-one -on -one interviews with people. And this, I don't talk, how's your left nostril? You know, what is the, are you watching your breath on your left nostril? No, I say, how you doing? <laughs> so where are you from? Yeah, and... Uh, and soon, 10 minutes in, they're talking about things that matter to them, that are on their minds, that, are, it's, that is, a, is a problem for them, that they're, at, they're looking for some way through. Mm -hmm. So that's the Dhamma, is some way through. Eh? And it's not just dry investigation of the texture of your breath at, at the tip of your nose. Uh, it's, it's about life itself. You know? So this is what you need is more in-depth uh, talk with uh, uh, a mature spiritual practitioner, you know, yeah. 
Okay, so I think one more question and that will be it. Ajahn, our final question today is from the live chat from Stevie. Ajahn, I am a mother to two young girls, and I've noticed that my ability to maintain loving kindness every day seems impossible. Do you have any suggestions for sustaining patience and kindness? Well, you have to be your own mom as well. You can't just be a mom to them. You have to be your own mother, and you have to recognize that just like you tell your your daughters, oh, you know, when they're exhausted and they they've reached their limits, you say, "Now, dear, well, let's let's go have a hamburger, or let's let's take a rest now, and so forth." So you have to be talking to yourself as well. You have to be raising yourself as well as raising them. And so you need breaks, and you need kindness, and you need the voice of another. And so I'm glad you asked about it because I get to be your daddy for a little bit here, and uh, I, I have great appreciation for. It. I have lots of mothers coming to this monastery with kids and, and the demands. And even even shortly after they give birth, sometimes I say, you know, they, you, you actually need to go on a retreat. You, you know, mothers are <clears throat> terribly afraid to leave their kids for a little while with somebody else. But if, if you don't take care of yourself, you won't be taking care of anybody else. And so you, you, you have to, <clears throat> if you go off on a little retreat or recuperation, you have to say to them, I have a gift for you. And everybody, all your your kids are excited. Oh, you got a gift for us, Mom? Yeah, I'm going away for a while. <laughs> Why is that a gift for us, Mom? Because when I come back, I'll be happy. <laughs> so you have to give your family a gift every now and then. And that is, you have to have a, you give yourself some time out and get refreshed and so forth in order to be a gift to your family. Otherwise, you're going to just run right out of patience and everything. So that's the advice I have to give quite often to mothers. <laughs> okay, well, that is it for today. And we will leave it for... We will be back next week with this a live stream. And I will turn it over to Pia to remind you about the retreat coming up as well, the virtual retreat. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, just to remind everyone that you can register now for our upcoming uh, Elements Retreat, which will be June 8th through 13th. And more details can be found at our website, Birken, B-I-R-K-E-N dot C-A. Just click on that link on the homepage and you'll find out more. Thank you.